Um, I think we're good to go. Um, all right, so welcome everyone. My name is Katie. I'm the Washington event coordinator for She Jumps. I'm coming to you from the Spokane Indian Reservation. Um, and we're here to talk about our Know Before You Go. This is one of our She Jumps um, favorite events. We're happy to bring you here to share it with you. We've got our partners here from Longleaf Wilderness Medicine. We've got Katie Luthley. We've got Galen May from Schweitzer. Um, we've got Melissa Hendrickson from the Idaho Panhandle Avalanche Center and Mark Schneider from Rambler Raver Gear Trader. Lost my mouth. There we go. All right. So She Jumps is an organization that's committed to transformative play outdoors. Um, we are a national organization. It's all about increasing the participation of women and girls outside. For a lot of us, uh, nature is our escape. It's that place that we go to feel um, ourselves in a lot of ways. And um, She Jumps is here to support that and help encourage you to get out and play. And we're here to encourage you to get out this winter, especially nature is a great teacher, but she's also a wonderful therapist. Winter is one of my favorite seasons. It's actually probably my favorite season because it's so quiet and peaceful outside with all the snow that we get here. And um, it's just a nice time to reflect and really um, get out and appreciate it. But we have to make sure that we're getting out there safely for all the different conditions we have out here in winter. Um, so without further ado, we are here to talk about safety and we always wanna make sure we're putting safety first when we're out there. Um, with that being said, this event is being recorded um, and we're doing that so that we can post it and you can share it after you can share it with your friends, you can share it with everybody and anybody you want. You can come back and rewatch it um, and get all the information that you can from it. If you do have questions, we are gonna do a question and answer session at the end. Please put your questions in the question and answer section as opposed to the chat. Um, because they might get lost in the chat a bit. Um, so just keep them in that question and answer section. We can um, update them. If it, your question is for a specific speaker, make sure you include their name so that um, they answer for you. Um, and then we'll come up to that at the end. So without any further ado, we'll get started with um, Melissa Hendrickson, an avalanche forecaster at IPAC. Um, Oh, I forgot to read these slides. I'm sorry about that. So, um, yeah, so we'll get started with Melissa here um, from IPAC. Hey, folks, it's Melissa from IPAC. Um, so, one of the, um, and so I've been a forecaster with Idaho Panhandle Avalanche Center since 2016. And so I'm in charge of doing um, forecasts to let people know that are going in the backcountry to either ski or snowboard or snowshoe or snowmobile, what the avalanche conditions are and how they can help themselves uh, stay safer in the mountains. So part of playing in the mountains in the winter is knowing the weather. Um, and we have lots of great resources on the web for weather. Um, you know, we first want to start with noaa.gov or weather.gov. Um, this is the National um, Weather Service, and I always like to use that one first, um, rather than using a weather app on my phone or, you know, a, some other weather bug that you download, because the models are mostly run through the National Weather Service, and then those other uh, weather apps take the original models and then tweak them just a little bit more. So it's, I like to start with the base data that the National Weather Service has and use those. So just remember that little uh, nuance if you do actually use the, the super easy weather app on your phone. Um, and so you can go in there, you can go and type your zip code in, um, but if you're looking for a more specific mountain area, you can either use the map function in there to get a pinpoint forecast for the um, specific area that you're traveling to. Um, or you can check out uh, the Missoula Backcountry Weather Forecast. And so you just type into Google Missoula Backcountry Weather Forecast, and that will pop up for the Montana side of the border um, with point locations for mountain weather, which will give you the mountain weather from 5,000 to 7,000 feet. Uh, we're working on developing that for the Spokane area, um, forecasting area as well. And then the NWAC, which is the Northwest Avalanche Center Mountain Weather Forecast, has the same similarities that our, our Missoula one has. So those are great 
places and to look up the weather. You know, when we're in there, we want to look up what's the temperature doing? Is it going to be cold, warm? What's the wind doing? Which direction is the wind coming from? What's our precipitation? To know how to really fully prepare ourselves for going outside and, um, you know, knowing what to bring. Uh, so you can look at the overview um, and then we're checking for storm alerts. So through the, the Avalanche Center, we only put out forecasts two days a week here in um, the Idaho Panhandle Avalanche Center. The Northwest Avalanche Center does seven day a week forecasts. But in between for the Idaho side, if we have a high enough avalanche danger, which is a warning, that will also be listed on um, that uh, weather sites that you see. So you'll be, you'll be notified of that. And then if any, there are any major storms, you know, you'll get that storm alert through those weather forecasts as well to know that um, maybe you should be a little bit more heads up about your driving conditions. Maybe you want to delay your trip. Um, you might not even be going to the mountains. You might be going to see grandma over the pass. Um, and so you want to, you know, be, be the best prepared that you can be for going out in the winter. Webcams are also a great place to get an idea of what's going on um, out in the mountains. Uh, PanhandleBackcountry.com, their weather site has a very good uh, list of all the webcams and it, it puts them all on one page. Um, so you can go in and look at all the different webcams across the area. But for instance, I use the webcams from Schweitzer, from Silver, from Lookout. And then I also use the highway cameras from like Lookout Pass and 4th of July in Idaho um, to you know see what's going on on the roads. Um, and then snow tells are uh, a site that's run by the NRCS, which is a, a Department of the Agriculture or a Division of the Department of Agriculture. And it's used to monitor snowpack in the mountains as it pertains to runoff and agriculture in the summer. Um, but these snow, the snow tail sites give us a very good indication of what's happening on the ground. And so they're scattered throughout the mountains. If you just type in snow tail into Google, um, you can bring up a map of where all those snow tails are located. For instance, if you are in uh, the Silver Valley corridor, so along I-90, we have the Lookout snow tail and the Sunset Peak snow tail, which, um, so if you go in there, you can see what the temperature is. You can see how much snow has fallen on the ground. It has a very easy inter face to look at see what's happened over the past seven days um, and then how heavy that snow is how you know to be able to judge what the density is so these are, that's kind of an overview of um, how we get weather and how we can start becoming our own weather forecasters um, and be most prepared in the backcountry in the winter so go ahead and go to the next slide please And then if we're traveling in mountains, we need to be aware of avalanche danger. Anytime that there's snow on the ground in the mountains, there is a potential for avalanches. Um, avalanches happen in uh, hills and mountains that are between 30 degrees and 45 degrees. And so it's pretty much anywhere that has mountains in um, North Idaho, if you're going up high enough. And you can get more information about the avalanche danger by reading avalanche reports. And so I am a forecaster for the Idaho Panhandle Avalanche Center, and ours can be found at idahopanhandleavalanche.org. If you're um, a little bit further to the west, this is the Northwest Avalanche Center. And if you can't remember the names of the avalanche center, just go to avalanche.org, and it shows all of the avalanche centers in the United States. And so you just click on the area that you're planning to go visit, and that will bring you in for more detailed information um, about what the avalanche conditions are. So it's very important to read these reports. Um, they're gonna have a lot of information there, um, and I highly recommend taking furthering education and taking avalanche education to be able to fully utilize those reports and make the best decisions and the most fun decisions to go into the backcountry. So you're gonna, you're gonna look at the bottom line and you're gonna look at the danger rating. And so this is gonna be a broad overview of what um, we as forecasters are predicting the danger rating will be in the mountains. And then we'll have certain problems that we list underneath there and we'll have travel advice that goes with them. So you wanna read and understand those problems. So whether we're having wind slabs, we're having wet slabs, you know, all of these things are gonna be listed in the forecast. So it's your key to being able to recreate safely and making good conscious decisions when you're in the mountain. Um, and playing in the mountains and playing in avalanche terrain is a very, very big deal. Um, and the only way that you can do it safely is by furthering your education. So there are lots of places to take courses. There's a lot of stuff that you can start doing online right now on your own. Um, 
the Know Before You Go website has an, an excellent 15 minute video um, that you can watch. Uh, you can attend She Jumps events like this. The Backcountry Access website has a lot of good training videos as well. Um, but none of these really replace uh, education, in-person education that has a field component. Um, and so Avalanche training classes are listed through ARI, and then we also list them through our education page at IPAC. Um, the Northwest Avalanche Center has a page as well for education. Our classes are currently full um, through IPAC for this winter, um, but if you check out the ARI website or the Northwest Avalanche Center website, um, you can find more locations that still have availability. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And I think I'm out. We'll talk to everybody later. Where did my meeting go? I lost my screen. There it is. All right. So after you've figured out where it's safe to travel, because you know your weather, you've known your avalanche forecast, um, there's some, a lot of cool resources to help you find like specific trails that you want to go on and get that beta before you actually go out, get some more beta. Um, so my favorites are all trails in the WTA Trailblazers app. I, or the, I haven't used the Idaho Trails Association app as much or their website as much because I mostly live in Washington. Um, but I typically check both because a lot of people aren't going to report their trips on both. They won't put on both, so you'll get different information on both from like recent information. And then there's also a whole lot of Facebook groups where you couldn't just post questions, all kinds of things. So the first one is obviously the She Jumps in the Northwest group. If you're not a part of our She Jumps regional group, I highly recommend joining it. It's a place where we can plan some adventures to get out together or just ask general questions and get to know each other in the area. Um, and then there's also a couple other more larger regional groups like the Washington Hikers and Climbers group, the PNW Snowboard Skiers and Adventures group and Ski Northwest. So three groups um, are all pretty large and pretty much if you post a question there, you're going to get an answer. There's also a whole lot of resources already in them. And then I also like to follow friends of IPAC on both Facebook. And then I also started following them on Instagram. And it's really great because um, they do some really cool stories. Like I think it was Melissa was out in the field who walked through her whole forecasting a few days ago. And it's just really cool to see and they share a lot of their um, big oversights on there. And then the last thing you can use is Gaia GPS. Um, I don't know much about Gaia, so I'm going to turn it over to Angela to talk more about navigation and introduce us more to Gaia. Hi, everyone. I'm Angela. I'm the Marketing and Partnerships Manager for She Jumps. And for navigation, Gaia GPS is a planning and navigation app and website to help you stay safer while exploring the backcountry. Having a tool like Gaia allows you to always have a map and pinpoint exactly where you are in case you lose a trail, which is especially important in the winter. Um, if inclement weather rolls in or if you just want to know what's ahead. Uh, we always recommend also bringing a, a backup map and compass and knowing how to use them in case your batteries die. Um, so for planning using Gaia GPS, you can find and download a route um, on Gaia's database of trails, national parks, and wilderness areas on GaiaGPS.com, or you can use the app as well. And Gaia has hundreds of map layers to test out and find what works for you. You can also use, look at national park satellite imagery, um, topographic maps, and check for things like precipitation, snow depth, and avalanche danger, so you know what to expect before you head outdoors. Uh, and then, uh, so, Tracking and navigating using your app, you can using the app, you can record a route of where you've been and see where you need to go if you download the map offline. And uh, and then you can also follow the trail on the map and know where to go um, from the app. And especially when again the, the trails are covered or if you're like forging your own way through the snow. And uh, the most important thing with navigation is understanding how to read the details on a topographic map. If you decide to make your own trail, just knowing the elevation, the vertical gain, um, how much mileage you have left, and knowing how to get back to your car. Um, and it, with the snow, I always just like to caution, um, give people caution to check the map that you're, if you're following other footpaths that go through the snow, because it, they, might not have known where they are going either. <laughs> so just a good tip. And then uh, we will be following up 
uh, the event with an email. So check your email after the event, most likely tomorrow where we're gonna send out the recording. Uh, but we're also offering a free three month trial to Gaia GPS. Uh, so you can sign up, try it out. And we're offering, I think it's on January 20th, we are offering um, a Gaia GPS led like in tutorial on how to use their tool for trip planning. And it's another um, virtual online event that we're offering. So go ahead and go to our Facebook page and find the event and register for it if you're interested in learning more. I think I'm done. <laughs> uh, hi guys, one minute. I'm starting my video. There we go. Hi, um, I'm Galen. I'm a Switzer Ski Patroller uh, for the past five years and I'm an avid winter explorer <laughs> uh, continuing on. Um, so whenever you go in the bat in the outdoor area, you want to ask yourself several questions. Uh, Going with the who, what, when, and where, uh, depending on your answers to certain questions that you are dealing with, you might affect the other answers to the other questions. Who you're gonna go out with definitely is a huge thing. Choosing the group that you're going with, these are the people that you love, you wanna keep safe, hopefully they wanna keep you safe, especially going in the back country. Um, so what is their skill, skill level? What's their certifications? What experience do they have? What fitness do they have? Um, going in the big back country, that's a bigger thing. But if you're just going to go snowshoeing, it's not that big of a deal. Um, you're probably going to be okay, but that affects what activities are you going to go on? Are you going to go snowshoeing? Are you going to go back country skiing? Are you going to go in resort skiing? Are you going to go cross country skiing? There's so many options. Um, so what experience level is needed? Um, if you're going to go back country skiing, um, obviously there's a lot more experience level that is needed, but if you're going to go snowshoeing, not so much. Um, what is the weather you're going to come across? Um, the avalanche forecast obviously is a huge thing. Um, what's the past weather? How much snow are you going to be snowing, snowshoeing through? That could affect um, your trail choice. Maybe if we got 13 inches of snow when, and you want to go out and a snowshoe on a not very uh, visited snowshoe trail, well, you're gonna be trudging through some snow, <laughs> a lot of snow, and that takes a lot more energy and a lot more time. So that's gonna affect your when <laughs> of how long you're gonna go for, um, how much daytime you need. Um, obviously in the winter, we have shorter days. So you gotta keep that in mind, um, thinking about Oh, I realize that it, the daylight's getting a little short, 4 p.m. Um, maybe I'm going to try to turn around at this time. And just being aware of how long you are planning to spend hiking or in the backcountry so you don't get stuck out there in weird situations and you're safe and you're happy. <laughs> um, and then all that affects the where. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to do this? Um, how much of a challenge do you want and how much of a challenge does your group want? Uh, what are your limitations? And then what is your full group limitations? Those are all questions you have to kind of bundle up into this big complex ball. Or it could be a very simple ball, depending on activity, depending on when, depending on where, depending on who. <laughs> Once again, uh, it's a fun little mystery. Uh, continuing on, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Katie? Okay, perfect. Snowshoeing. It's a great winter activity. Um, it's great exercise. It's accessible to all ages. It's in all abilities and it's inexpensive. Um, it also only requires like a few basic skills. If you can walk, um, you're pretty much there. You just have to walk a little bit farther apart so you don't get stuck on your snowshoes. Um, what you need is snowshoes, warm weather boots, winter layers, adjustable poles with baskets, and your 10 essentials. And then obviously, my favorite thing to do is keep in my car when I'm doing any of these activities that I'm going to talk about in the next couple slides is an extra pair of dry socks and an extra pair of dry shoes and a cotton t-shirt because changing out of that sweaty synthetic layer that you're wearing 
into a cotton t-shirt at the end of the day is probably the best feeling on planet earth. Um, and then also having warm and dry shoes when you drive home in your car, pretty good too. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, I just learned about this, but the Nordic club at Pine Street Woods, if you wanna go hiking there or snowshoeing there or cross country skiing there, they have a great uh, rental opportunity that's fairly cheap and that's pretty cool. But yeah, Schweitzer, Spokane Mountain, um, probably other snowshoe opportunities. Sorry, Katie. Uh, and then hiking. <laughs> Next. There we go. <laughs> Um, so yeah, winter hiking, uh, make sure your trail is open, make sure your trailhead is accessible. Um, a lot of winter roads aren't available um, or might not be plowed out and you don't wanna get stuck. Um, it's not a great thing when you get stuck in your car or stuck out in digging, digging your car out. Uh, time your hike with the sun. Once again, we already talked about uh, the sun is out a little bit shorter time than, the, than in the summers. Um, I always say, have a headlamp with you. I learned once at a hot springs and you're not trying to outlast those people and then you're hiking back in the dark and it's slippery and it's gross. Have a headlamp, it's a great thing. Um, consider snow specific hazards. Um, a lot of those trails that you could hike in the summer might not be an option in the winter just because they might be right where an avalanche path is. Um, Scotchman's Peak, obviously not a great path uh, hiking trail to go on. So just kind of keeping that in mind, but Mineral Point, Farragut State Park, um, Tubbs Hill, all great options, fun hiking. Um, bring a buddy, always good to bring a buddy. Uh, if you get hurt or you can't move, you got that other person to keep you safe and keep you happy. Uh, bring more layers than you think. Um, it's always good to start cold or cool when you're going outside and you're gonna, you know, you're gonna work up a sweat because as soon as you get those layers wet or cold with your sweat, you're gonna, you're not gonna get those layers dry again. So having a backpack to put those cold, uh, those layers that you wanna keep dry, those down layers, cause down doesn't work when it gets wet, synthetic kind of does, but keeping those layers dry away from your body. And then when you get cold and you're like, oh, I'm not working out as hard anymore, putting those layers back on and being happier is good. Uh, and of course, protect those feet, bring extra socks. Um, bring, have some warm socks in your, I'm not sure what happened with their audio here. It looks like we might have lost Galen, maybe. Still there, Galen? I can jump in for Galen. Yeah, I think we lost her. Yeah, there we go. All right. All right, so finishing up the hiking, um, one of the pro tips is to have yak tracks or micro spikes to gain traction on slippery inclines. Um, Speaking from experience of a person that has severely twisted their ankle, slipping on ice outside of the office, yak tracks are saviors. Um, a lot of hiking trails into hot springs or into waterfalls like we see in this picture are going to just be packed down. That snow is going to be packed down and become very slippery. So having just a little bit more balance um, can be, be the difference between having a good day and having a twisted ankle when you go home. So next slide. So there's lots of different types of skiing adventures that you can do out in the winter. Um, so we have backcountry skiing where you put skins on your skis and you human power yourself uphill and then you take them off and you ski downhill. Definitely requires a knowledge of avalanche strain to do that. We have 
uh, our resorts available to us. So, you know, Schweitzer, 49, Silver Mountain, Lookout, um, Mount Spokane, where we can go and ride uphill on the comfort of a chairlift, saving our legs, and then zoom downhill. And we have um, cross-country skiing uh, with several areas available, Mount Spokane, Farragut State Park, Schweitzer, um, and Fourth of July Nordic Trails. And so that cross-country skiing is a very good introduction to somebody that wants to get into winter sports for good exercise um, and have a little bit less gear requirement and a little, little less uh, knowledge needed to go deeper into the mountains. So, you, But for all three, you wanna make sure that you are prepared for that skiing adventure. So you wanna make sure if you're going to a Nordic center or an Alpine place, you wanna check ahead of time and make sure that the trails are open. So this could be checking websites or this could be checking forums um, to see, you know, especially in the, some of our lower elevation cross country trails, um, we might not have enough snow earlier in the season or if we have some of those rainstorms that come through. So it's definitely good to check ahead of time. Make sure that you are packing winter survival essentials. Um, you know, if anytime we're going away from our car in the winter, we wanna make sure that we're prepared. And we also want to make sure that our vehicles are prepared in case we get stranded um, in parking lots or on the side of the highway during a storm. We want to consider the snow specific hazards um, that we could encounter. So whether this is avalanche danger, whether this is tree wells um, at a, you know, where we're skiing downhill and there's concavities around the bottom of trees that we can get stuck in, um, whether it's ice that we could be hitting, uh, all sorts of those things. So we wanna make sure that we consider those. We wanna check our gear for safety and functionality. We don't wanna get halfway out somewhere and realize that we have a half broken ski or a binding, or um, you know, we've, we're using really, really old cross country skis that we bought off Craigslist that you know, the person says that they're definitely in, in good condition, but 25-year-old um, glue, let me tell you from experience, it does laminate from the bottom of your ski. And so therefore you're, you have a boot that has nothing to hook to your ski with. Uh, always pack duct tape. Um, taking lessons is a great way to um, learn a sport safely, to um, get to be able to learn how to develop the right muscles, the right technique to do, um, to participate in these sports. And not only to learn technique, but you can learn a lot of other winter travel tips and tricks from anybody that you take a lesson from. And then you always wanna ski with a partner, you know, going out in the winter uh, has a little bit more risk involved in the summer due to cold and exposure. And all of these activities are also more fun with a partner, especially if you're learning, you know, if you're, uh, like me and trying to take up a new sport in your late 30s, you know, we can suck at trying new things, but it's way more fun to fall down and wallow like a turtle in the snow um, if you have somebody else that's a good sport uh, to laugh at you, but also to help you up when you're doing that. And it kind of just rolls into that uh, pro tip. Don't have expectations. Let time and conditions dictate your day. Um, Mother Nature doesn't care that it's a weekend, doesn't care that it's your only day off. Um, so try to have a, a, an attitude that um, works well with that. And, you know, go out and expect to have fun, but don't exactly have those expectations written out solidly of how you're going to have that fun. So go ahead to the next slide. This one is, oh, say, hopefully Galen's back, back for this one. Did Galen get back on with uh, internet? Unmute. Unmute myself. There we go. Okay. I'm here. <laughs> uh, technical difficulties. Yay. Um, so going back to the first slide, we if you guys need to practice your beacon and going into backcountry zones, uh, Schweitzer does have beacon parks set up um, in primetime and in Sam's Alley. Uh, we have a double burial up upper, upper Sam's Alley, a single barrier burial in prime time and then also if you want to come on Sundays we do a beacon transceiver Sunday um, that you can come out with us at 10 a.m and learn about beacons and how to use them and also learn where our beacon parks are if you don't know already so come out and see us um, and anyway going on to these case studies recollecting um so we got two little case studies from this year um, it's kind of nice that we get to do this a little bit later 
um, in the season, just because we have some great um, examples for us to learn from. Uh, the first one is uh, the bottom two photos on the uh, the bottom two photos that are a little bit more gray, not a bluebird day. Yeah, right over there. Um, so this is a triggered uh, slide inbounds. Um, it was closed terrain. Um, I'm gonna kind of read it off with like just a little bit of hints of like, make you guys start using your brains. Um, shallow pack on rain crust is definitely not great. That was our early season kind of just built up with not much snow and definitely some rain events and some sun crests that I bet you Melissa has had some fun dealing with um, and talking about. And then also wind loading. So it was a Sunday or it's a Saturday, um, beginning of the holidays. People are stoked to get out there December 19th. Um, and we had opened, I don't know if anybody knows Swites are down, but uh, Swites are very well, but we had opened 12, um, not 12, we had opened uh, Australia down. So if you're looking at the left picture on the bottom, yeah, you can kind of see those trees by the, but even farther over, you can't even see the open train, but that is what is open. Um, and we had everything else, the whole bowl was closed and not available to skiers, um, but people traversed and um, they had gotten into this little zone and set off a lovely little um, slide, which actually wasn't very small. Um, it was a shallow point release at four to six inches, increasing to 18 inches. You can see in that center photo, kind of the main part where the person skied into at the very tippy top um, and how much it just kind of collected snow, train traps, trees, not a great place to set off a slide. Um, and it fell, 300 vertical feet and at the very bottom the debris pile was five feet deep. Um, we responded with five patrollers and two dogs and those dogs are so good that they found a hair tie in the debris pile and we didn't find any skiers obviously there's one ski track in and then one ski track directly out. We um, probe lined and had the dogs go through there. Uh, it probably took two hours for us to totally clear the area but that's also two hours that we have a lot of resources out of place, which is not a great, great thing. Um, elevation was 5,500 feet. And yeah, um, that's pretty much it. Uh, the lessons we learned from this is don't traverse. If we open terrain, that's our open terrain. Um, don't traverse out of it. Um, imagine that there's a vertical line on, line on either side of that terrain and don't go outside of it. We want to open that drain as much as we can and we try, but sometimes elements are out of our control and it's just something we can't do. Um, and it's closed for a reason. I have been ski cutting in the North Bowl and realize that there's people underneath me and I'm about to send a huge chunk of snow their way. Or we've been um, out towards Poochies and people cut our ropes and we hear laughing and we're throwing bombs and we're like, oh no. We can't open this at all. We were trying to open it, but people ruined that. And we're trying the best we can, we swear. Um, and we just want everyone to be happy and have fun. That's all we want. Okay, so the Sunday. Um, obviously, 10 inches of heavy in the last four days, our totals were, uh, it happened around 10 a.m. And if you were skiing that day, like you could see if you're riding up the Colburn Dripple or if you were riding up um, the other Lakeview Dripple, you could see that we got some pretty big results from our bombs. Um, we had five and a half foot crowns pulling across multiple shot points. Um, it was a pretty big day and you could kind of use those, those, the new snow on top of seeing that we got some big results inside in bounds, trying to keep you guys safe, um, not to go out in the back country. The country 
when you get new snow, especially that much new snow in such a short that morning, IPAC had issued Jess following them on Facebook, their little, uh, to just kind of get a little refresher and see the gear triggered at 10, it's the east base of the resort. Um, we had the whole mountain open. We can't really respond to that right away. Like we can with the inbounds, um, stuff. We have to be available for everything else. We had a lot of things going on. I think I did a backboard that morning. I had a knee injury and then a shoulder that morning too and I was looking up at this and I was like oh my god what are we going to do if there's someone in there we sent a patroller that direction they saw one set of ski tracks they definitely went for a little bit of a ride and then they skied out of it we sent Kenny um the Selkirk powder cat up to the top of Big Blue and they couldn't find a safe way in but they confirmed that they saw one track in and one track out along with one ski skin track up um and so that's kind of what we did. And that's all we can do. It's um, once you leave our backcountry gates, it's not side country anymore. Side country is not a thing, it's backcountry. You assume responsibility for yourself. Um, and that's all I can say. We will be there to help you out, but it may be a lot longer than you expect. Um, yeah. Uh, what we learned, read avalanche war cat, war, bleh, 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 forecasts, no red flags, new snow, wind, inbound results, all those things you definitely see. You can ski the North Pole and kind of see what we get each day if you're planning on going up to Big Blue. Um, you can even come in and ask us and just be like, hey, what'd you guys get in, in the North Pole or in the, during avalanche routes this morning? What'd you see? What are you guys seeing out there? It's totally fine. We want to share. We want to know. What you guys are thinking what you guys are doing and you guys can come ask us any questions um yeah don't ski by yourself also that's a big huge no-go if you're going in the backcountry do not ski by yourself um it's not a good thing you want your beacon on you you want your shovel your probe those only work if you have a partner with you to see you go down and have one person ski on that slope at a time let the snow settle and ski in bounds and then also take avalanche classes and have the gear and that's all i got to say All right. Anytime we're out, headed out in the winter or even in the summer um, to the woods or the backcountry, we want to have a plan. Um, and you want to leave this plan with someone you trust. So whether this is your parents, whether it's your roommate, whether it's your husband or your wife, um, or just some friend that has, it's better to have them have some knowledge of the area that you're going or some knowledge of even just like mountains in general they don't have to know you know the specifics of where you're going and or have been there before but just kind of understand how backcountry um, or mountain travel works um, and in this plan it's important to be pretty detailed so you want to include your departure time you know if you don't live with the person you want to tell them in the morning when you're leaving um, you want to tell them the trailhead that you're going to um, so that they know where your vehicle is going to be parked. You want to have that vehicle information to them. So a license plate, make, model, you know, in case if it's a very popular trailhead or if, you know, um, they need to notify authorities to say this is the vehicle that, you know, this person was drive, driving. Um, you want to have your estimated route of where you're going. Um, so where you're starting, where you're traveling to, what your goals are, what your backup option is. And then what your uh, estimated return time is. Um, and so I like to kind of do that twofold. So we have our estimated return. So, you know, my goal is to be back by dark. So back to the vehicle by four o'clock. But also I want them to have a time of when they should call for a search and rescue or call for help. So give me, you know, for me personally, it's give me two extra hours to get back. You know, if I'm not back by four, but something's kind of gone wrong, but it's not an emergency, um, you know, I have that extra leeway. You might have not have as much experience out. And so you want to have a more strict time. So, you know, say like, be alerted if I haven't been back in, uh, been back by one hour after my call out time. Um, and then also let them know who you're with and how to contact the significant others or the the call outs for um, your partner because um, it's important we are out in the back country we're the ones there keeping each other safe um, and so we need to have a safety outlet to have someone know if we're um, gone or missing so that's how 
we would like to, um, you know, to initiate that plan to go in them into the woods in the winter. Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm talking about layering, or excuse me, yeah, layering a couple other things. Um, you'll hear layering come up a lot. Uh, it, it does two things. Uh, is what it allows you to do is it allows you to add and remove layers as you're recreating, depending on the conditions. Um, for winter travel, you basically start with a base layer, um, something that doesn't fit tight, but is thin and next to your skin. Uh, from there, you would add you know, a, a mid layer, whether that be a fleece or a synthetic or a down puffy. Um, you could also do a fleece and then add another mid layer being another synthetic or, or some sort of down over top of that. And then your shell. Uh, your shell could be a windbreaker if there is no precipitation in the forecast or something that is waterproof like a rain jacket or a Gore-Tex shell. Rain jackets are fine uh, for keeping the water out, but they also don't allow for breathability. So if you are going to be perspiring, you need to make sure that you can let that moisture out of your clothing as well as keep the moisture out. Uh, excuse me, get the moisture out of your clothing as well as keep additional moisture out. Um, so there, there's different layers that work in different conditions, but uh, not only does it allow you to add and remove layers, but it also allows you to multi-purpose your gear. So if you're trying to, you know, uh, recreate on a budget, you can use the windbreaker that you carry with you in the summer. You can use that as an outer layer in the winter on nice bluebird days in order to give you a little bit more protection from the wind. So layering does, does two things for you. Um, second line, say no to cotton. Cotton absorbs moisture and it sticks to your skin and it robs your body of heat. Cotton is not a good natural fabric for recreating in any of the outdoors, but more, um, it's more dangerous obviously when you get into colder temperatures. I've watched people hiking where they thought they were fine. You perspire, uh, you build up that moisture and you very quickly can become borderline or into hypothermia. So stay away from the cotton. Um, in addition to that, cotton also down is something to watch out for. Somebody had already mentioned it. Down is an amazing material when it comes to keeping you warm, but it does not do well with moisture. Once down gets wet, it mats and you've lost all of the insulating properties that come with it. So down is great. Don't wear it next to your skin. Um, I also I recommend having a base layer and maybe even a light mid layer before you wear down. That'll keep your perspiration away from it. And then on the outside of it, you want to have some sort of shell if there's going to be moisture to keep the rain or the snow from melting on the down and impacting it there. Wool is a really great natural fiber if uh, you're into that. I, I, over the years, have switched all of my cotton that I grew up with over to wool um, from socks all the way up. It, it's great. It can be a bit pricey and some people have skin, uh, skin uh, allergies associated with it, but if, um, if you can tolerate it, wool does really well. All the synthetic materials um, do really well too. Um, cover your skin, it goes without saying, any exposed skin is gonna get cold faster. Um, you know, wind burn, um, frostbite, that all comes with exposed skin. Um, avoid tight clothing. Uh, you know, tight clothing is restrictive. It can cut off blood flow to your extremities. Uh, it might not seem much, but any amount of restriction is, is going to close off those blood vessels, keep the flow um, from reaching your extremities and can lead to frostbite and hypothermia. Um, it, transversely, I also advise against uh, too loose of a layer as well. Uh, if you have a really loose jacket and you're recreating, uh, it can create a billowing effect. And so you can pull air in and out from underneath your jacket and that can rob you of your heat as well. Um, you can use artificial means to add heat. Uh, you've seen the, the chemical reactive heat packs that you can buy. Um, those work really well. They usually last four to six hours. Um, and you know some gloves will have a little pocket on the back where you can add it there and the blood flow from the back of your hand will move that into your extremities. You can also put them in your boots. Um, they work well. Hot drinks work really good for heat in the car, whether it be tea or coffee, hot chocolate, 
um, whatever your drink, uh, a thermos with a hot drink um, can, can really boost your internal core temperature. Wear hats. I, I, I don't know the numbers, but uh, you lose a disproportionate amount of heat from your head versus other parts of your body. Um, that can be hard when you're recreating. You got to make sure to, you know, to not sweat through your head either. Headbands are what I like to wear um, when, when I'm uh, doing uphill travel or anything strenuous. Um, it, it, it allows you know, me to release heat, but keeps my ears warm, um, keeps the sweat out of my eyes. Uh, sunglasses or goggles. Um, everybody's heard the term snow blind. Um, on a nice bluebird day, you're going to catch the sun from the sky as well as the reflection coming off the snow. This is also applicable with water too. So having sunglasses or goggles is really good to, to keep your, the sun out of your eye. Um, and it also helps when you're in driving snow too. So if you have snow coming in sideways, you get caught in a storm, it can actually be really hard to even keep your eyes open long enough to see where you're going. Um, if you're using electronics that require batteries, know that as soon as that battery gets cold, its life expectancy drops significantly. Uh, you'll see sometimes with cell phones, um, they'll drop their battery. And then once you get them warm again, uh, they'll come back to life. So uh, batteries do not like the cold. If you're depending on electronics, make sure to keep the electronics in an inside pocket or the spare batteries in an inside pocket as well. Um, I like uh, if, if a clothing piece of clothing I'm wearing has a Napoleon pocket inside my shell into my mid layer, I'll put it up there. It keeps it close to your chest. Uh, usually that's a, a bit you know, closer to your body versus something like a, a pant pocket where it, it can be a little bit more loose and, and not keeping close contact to your internal body heat. Sunscreen, um, you know, the sun's rays are not as powerful in the winter, but if you're out on a bluebird day or near a water source, again, you can catch that reflection coming up from the snow as well from the, the sun directly. Uh, so sunscreen is important. Um, yeah, and then bring the 10 essentials and that's the next slide. All right, um, navigation is the first of 10 essentials. Uh, numerous sources of navigation are good. Electronics are great. Everyone has a smartphone at this point, or, or most everyone has smartphones. Gaia is, uh, was mentioned by Angela earlier. That's the app I use when I'm going into the back country. It's, uh, it's, it's a very powerful app. It can be a little overwhelming when you first use it, but once you get the hang of it, uh, there's a lot of great resources there. All Trails is another one for more popular routes. Uh, it's a good navigation tool. Um, you know, GPS is uh, are, are preferred when you need something a bit more rugged. You need to make sure it stays waterproof. You can also replace water or excuse me, batteries on GPSs, whereas cell phones are pretty much um, intact. You can do backup battery or power supplies as well. That being said, electronics are great, but they're fallible, right? They they can fail. So you need to make sure that if you're going away from a popular area or you know you're taking a significant trip that you also carry and understand how to use a map a compass an altimeter uh, all three of those tools it's old school navigation but it can actually be really fun um, it, it's important to have because again electronics fail but it's actually fun to, to use a map and a compass and try to find your way around i'll do it often where i'll, I'll stay away from my gps i have it i have all the maps downloaded i'm ready to use them but I use the map and compass first to see if I can find my way around. And then when I get into a sticky spot, I can you know, turn my GPS on and figure it out from there. Again, more of an advanced technique, but uh, having a backup to that GPS or cell phone is important. Also keeping an eye on if you're using your cell phone, depending on that, where you have service. And when you get out into the woods, it doesn't take much to go around a bend into a swale, uh, down into a ravine, and there you've lost cell phone service. And, and with that, if you don't have maps pre-downloaded, you've lost your navigation. Um, so being aware of your surroundings and that Gaia has a really good, if you pay for the feature, you can pre-download the maps, turn your phone into airplane mode, conserve battery power and, and navigate that way. Um, headlamps, uh, headlamps and extra batteries. Department store headlamps work really well at a, at a, at a base level, but they are typically not waterproof or shock resistant. A good headlamp from a reputable brand name is, is very important. 
uh, and then carrying extra batteries or an additional headlamp uh, for a backup. Um, I typically carry two headlamps with me, um, one a bit more powerful and then another one that's lighter weight, but it's a good backup. Sun protection, mentioned that earlier. Sunglasses, um, clothing that's rated for sun protection or sunscreen. It, it's important. Again, it, when you're cold out, it, it, it doesn't seem important. Uh, you don't think you're getting a sunburn, but it definitely happens. Um, first aid kits. Uh, you can either go online, do some searches and find um, great lists of do-it-yourself first aid kits or companies like Adventure Medical Kits. They do really great single person day trip bags all the way up to numerous people for multiple day backpacking trips. So you can customize and, and buy a, a pre-made medical kit that fits for your recreation needs. Um, don't skip out on the foot care, uh, mole skin, um, glide to make sure you don't get chafing or blisters. Once that stuff sets in, it can be pretty difficult. Um, insect repellent is on the screen. Typically not an issue in the winter, but um, you know, where applicable. A knife, um, knife or a multi-tool or other repair kits is, is a great thing to have in the woods. Um, needle, thread, tape, uh, companies like Gear Aid make nice patches if you get rips in your clothing. Um, so it's good to have that, those tools. Uh, you know, knives and multi-tools come into play when it comes to repairing gear, getting tinder for fires. Uh, they're a great uh, all-purpose tool to have. Uh, and then into the fires, I again like to have multiple sources, um, matches and a lighter or um, you know, tinder or a, a strike stick, uh, something that you can use, you know, magnesium strip, um, something that you can start a fire with if you need it. Again, multiple sources, it's really easy and lightweight to carry some strike anywhere matches in addition to that lighter or that camp stove that you have. Uh, camp stove, some of them have piezels, but even with the piezel, you, you'll want that lighter or that match backup to get that stove going. Shelter, uh, if you're going to be going out, you know, multi-day trips, obviously you're going to have a tent or some sort of shelter with you, but at the very least, uh, you can buy little reflective personal bivvies. They don't take up much weight. They don't take up much space. But if you find yourself in a place where say you fall in the water or you perspire to the point where you're, you're getting cold, borderline hypothermic because of lack of heat, these, uh, reflective lightweight bivvies will allow you to climb inside of them and surprisingly they, they they weigh nothing they're super thin but it's amazing how much heat they'll retain um and, and again shelter beyond that you know pieces of tyvek or um you know a light purse light one person shelter that you can set up hastily to protect you from the elements um, depending on where you're going or how long you're going to be out um, they can save your life um extra food Always plan for extra food. I, I typically like to have at least half as much as I need um, or I want for a given day. So if I'm going hiking for eight hours, I want to carry enough for at least 12 hours, if not 16 hours. Um, it's good to plan to be out overnight. You know, So if you're on a day hike, what would happen if you got stuck out there overnight? How much nutrition would you need to, to be safe until the next day? And obviously when you're going multi-day, then you need to add another day, if not additional days on top of that. Water, same thing. Always plan for more water, especially in winter. It's really easy to dehydrate in the winter. Um, in the summer, you get hot, you sweat, you drink water. In the winter, you're a bit cold. Um, you don't realize you're sweating. You don't realize that you're still perspiring and you're still dehydrating. Uh, so it's important to, to pay attention to your body. And even when you're not thirsty, always be drinking, consuming the water that you brought with you. Um, if you can't carry enough water, have another water source, whether it be a stove to melt water, or if you can get access to fresh water, having a filter or bleach um, to, to treat that water with. Uh, bleach is a really easy one. It's two drops per liter uh, and then 20 minutes worth of set time. And that's all it takes to, to purify that water. So bleach is one that I carry with me even when I have a filter. It's a great backup. Um, extra clothes, that goes back to the layering, plan for the worst case scenario, and then have that in your pack so that as you perspire, you can remove layers 
And then you have those in your pack for when you stop for lunch and you can put those layers back on. And again, make sure to always have that outer layer, even if it's a nice bluebird day, uh, a rain jacket or a Gore-Tex layer, something that you can put on if that random snowstorm or, um, or snow, snowstorm or rainstorm um, comes into play. And where to get it? Um, rentals, uh, I appreciate you guys put me at the top of the list. We started doing rentals this year. We're doing snowshoes and hawk snow skis. Um, in the future, I plan on expanding. My business is growing, which is great. So we plan on having more rental options outside of this. All of our local towns, there's too many people to list. Uh, Spokane has a number of ski shops that do rentals. I, I'm not as familiar being in Spokane with uh, Nordic or snowshoeing rental options up there. Uh, there's a number of them in Coeur d'Alene. You know, all the ski mountains have rentals options. Mount Spokane has Fitness Fanatics that does cross country and snowshoes out of their shack. And then Mount Spokane ski area, they do downhill skis from there. So lots of great. And then the source up at Schweitzer um, is, is another good option for rentals. Used gear. So my business is uh, primarily a consignment shop. So it's people like you bring in the stuff you don't need anymore, turn it around for money. Um, so we're a great option for used gear. Um, you know, we filter out all of the, the lesser quality brand names uh, so that when you come and shop with us, you, you know you're getting the good stuff. Uh, beyond that, Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, uh, there's a lot of online options, you know, eBay and, and gear trade and, and, and things like that um, where you can check out gear. I caution with Craigslist and Facebook, um, you know, people that are selling things on those uh, platforms don't necessarily have an obligation to you. So you won't always get the best advice. So if you're looking for good advice, go to a reputable shop or do your research. Don't trust the person that's selling a jacket on eBay as to whether or not it's going to work for you. Thrift stores are another excellent option. Uh, the downside of thrift stores is you have to spend a lot of time picking through the lesser known brands or the lesser quality brands. There are a lot of good gems in there if you recognize your brands and you know what your materials are. Uh, so I, I caution with that again, know what you're doing, but you're gonna get some amazing deals if you have the patience for thrift stores. And borrowing from a friend. Um, I, as well as a lot of people I know, when you upgrade your gear, you don't throw away that old sleeping bag, you don't throw away that old jacket because you have friends that you might wanna take out. So ask your friends. Um, before you invest in a hobby, you, you may as well see if you can borrow some gear or rent gear and decide whether or not you like it enough to invest in that hobby. Um, I, again, was a customer of a consignment shop before I ever opened my own. It allowed me to get into a sport, see if I liked it before I invest in the, the, the really expensive brand new retail gear. Um, and then local retail shops, you hear it come up a lot. Uh, there's some great big box stores that, that sell outdoor gear, but if you're gonna go out, um, I recommend checking out the local shops first you're going to get a personalized experience. The, the locals have more information on where to recreate, what to look for, what gear fits the train that you're going to check out. It, it's, a, it's a much more personalized experience when you check out the local shops. So Sandpoint, Schweitzer, you, know, you have the Source, you have the Alpine Shop, um, Sandpoint Sports, Ski Shack in Hayden, Tri-City Outfitters. There's a lot of great resources, you know, here in Spokane, um, we have uh, numerous ski shops, bike shops, uh, water sports shops. Again, all those guys are going to give you great advice and they have a vested interest in making sure that you have a pleasurable experience when you're outdoors that that brings you back to them. So support local. Thank you for sharing this experience with me and have a great night. All right, guys, I recognize that we are running a little over on time here. We've just got a lot of information we're trying to share, trying to get through it as quickly as we can, but we are going to go a little bit over. Um, so next, we're going to talk about hydration. Like Mark was saying, you always want to make sure you have extra water with you. Um, I personally like to fill them with warm water in the morning because then they're like Mark was saying, it's a great way to add heat to your body. It's if you're drinking that warm water. When I'm skiing in a resort, I like to use those squishy water bottles because I can put it in my pocket, like right up against my body. And then if I put warm water in there, it'll stay nice and warm in there. Um, you do want to make sure you're bringing plenty of plenty of water, though, and make sure you're drinking 
um, as you're going because you're going to constantly be losing water as you're exercising and even though you're nice and cold maybe um, you're still sweating and losing that water so it's really important to make sure you're drinking water and using your reusable water bottles I caution against people who like to carry camelbacks in the winter unless you have an insulated hose line and an insulated shoulder strap that can hold your hose line they freeze really easily um, so you just want to be aware of that make sure um, that you're properly taking care of your hose line. Um, and then move into food here real quick. Uh, so for food, you always want to make sure you're packing food that you love. It want to be something that you're actually going to eat. I love to pack nut butter. Um, I mostly do day trips. So most of my stuff, I typically load my pockets with snacks, nut butter, um, trail mix, protein bars. Uh, sometimes I carry like those little oranges, but that's typically only if I'm in a resort and I have somewhere, you know, I'm not worried about it. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Katie with Longleaf Medicine, who can tell us a bit more about how food helps us um, with uh, avoiding hypothermia and staying warm and everything. Great. Thanks, Katie. And if you'll just pu push the slide to the next one, and then I can talk about food kind of as we go. But my name is Katie Luthi. I live in Sandpoint, and I'm one of the owners of Longleaf Wilderness Medicine. And so we teach people wilderness first aid courses, wilderness first responder courses. And we are now teaching because it's so hard to gather an online outdoor first aid class so that people can still get the training that they need because we are getting out in bigger numbers than we have in the past. And so making sure that people are prepared to be able to respond to emergencies. But the big thing is that we want to be able to prevent those emergencies. And seeing that we're talking about winter sports, we really wanna take a look at prevention of cold injuries. And so in addition to my wilderness medicine background, I've also um, worked on a lot of expeditions, including one winter where I spent the, um, the winter in northern Minnesota running dog sled expeditions. And the temperature consistently was around negative 40. And so I learned a lot of really good tricks. And surprisingly, I still have all my fingers, so it didn't have frostbite. I'm still here, so I didn't succumb to hypothermia. And so it is possible to stay warm and to stay comfortable in, in cold weather. Um, we really want to talk prevention and kind of like everything else that we've talked about tonight, prevention and making sure that we are taking care of ourselves ahead of time is the biggest piece so that we don't have to respond to issues later on. And so keeping ourselves warm is going to be the biggest thing. It's easier to stay warm than it is to get warm. And so our bodies are kind of in this big fight to be able to maintain that heat balance. And if we're able just to keep that heat in, then we don't have to be able to fight and, and put all of that energy into keeping ourselves warm. We want to address appropriately, and that is layering and delayering. And so if you are super active and you're out and you're snowshoeing or cross-country skiing or even skiing in the resort, like you'll see people who have like a bunch of clothes on and then as soon as um, they start gaining some heat, they like take layers off and then they stop and then they're throwing layers back on. And so it's this constant balance of again, getting the clothes on and off as you try to make sure that you don't get super sweaty and that you're able to keep the heat that your body has created. I can't say it enough, but we want to eat, we want to eat, we want to eat. Um, and I think that it is, it's one of my favorite things to talk about, but really taking a look at the importance of food and what that food is. And so I like to look at food as in kind of keeping my body heat appropriate as building a fire and the things that the kindling and the tinder is going to be simple carbs. So like those fast burning sugars. So um, thinking honey, thinking gummy bears, thinking Sour Patch Kids, things that like your body can turn into fuel pretty quickly, followed by complex carbohydrates. So thinking about granola bars, that type of thing. And then followed by like the big logs um, that you would put on a fire to sustain that fire. And that can be things like Snickers bars, but it's fats and proteins that are going to be able to maintain that heat for you. Big pieces don't try to tough it out. We all want to like be like, we can do this. It's just this short period of time. I've got this. Don't worry about the blister. Don't worry about that I'm sweaty, that type of thing. But really, if you're cold, take a moment, address the problem. If you're sweaty, like let's get those layers taken care of. If your fingers are really cold, let's get them to the back of your neck, do some big arm circles, that type of thing. Again, let's try to catch things before they progress into something more serious. Cold fingers, a great place. Put them at the back of your neck, put them up in your armpits, but places where they can get um, a lot of warmth. If you've got cold toes, 
finding a friend and again hanging out with that buddy, um, their stomach is a really good place for you to put those toes to get them warmed back up. Um, and as was talked about, hand and toe warmers can be super effective for short periods of time. Just don't put them right next to your skin because you can cause some chemical burns. So a good rule of thumb is to put them between a liner glove and an outer glove or between your sock um, and the shoe, not next to your skin. And then keep an eye on your friends. Like we want to be able to travel with these people long term and knowing like the personality of the people that you're traveling with. So if they start to get super grumpy or they start to get really quiet or there's something going on, like let's let's identify what's going on for them and fix their problems so that they're able to stay out and have a fun day as well. And again, addressing problems before they show up. Katie, can you get to the next one, please? When we take a look at heat loss and heat, or keeping our, our temperature normal, we want to take a look at the balance between a heat loss and heat gain, and it's really important to know how we lose heat. And so we lose heat through conduction, and so our body pushes heat towards a colder place. And so thinking about standing on cold ground or sitting on cold ground, we get cold pretty quick because our body is pushing that warm, that warm heat down into the cold. We can get convection, which is when a wind strips across and that wind strips heat away from the body, which is why that wind layer is so important. We've got radiation. And so thinking about that bare head, again, if you're not wearing a hat, your head is gonna push, your body's gonna push heat out into that colder environment as it's trying to be able to balance that heat. And then evaporation and looking that primarily at sweat. And as that sweat dries, it's gonna be, um, result in that cooling process. So we've got like the heat loss and so we have to like look at like how how are we losing heat what are our behaviors that are making this like making our body get rid of heat and then taking a look at how we gain heat and so those two big things are going to be metabolism and they're going to be movement and so going back to those principles of food and making sure that folks are eating simple sugars followed by complex carbohydrates proteins and fats um, because really what we're trying to do is to get the body's fire burning and that, that furnace pushing heat for itself. We're not going to be concerned about getting big puffy layers on because if we put a big puffy layer on top of a cold person, it's just going to insulate a cold body. I like to talk about how if you have a snowman, then you put a down jacket on that snowman, it doesn't melt the snowman. It's just trapping the cold that's there. And so we want to make sure that we're putting big puffy layers on something that's warm. And we're going to be warm because we've put food in our faces and because we've been moving around. Katie, can you hit the next slide, please? When we take a look at hypothermia, there's a number of phases of hypothermia, and I think we just all need to start by acknowledging that if we're outdoors in the winter, it's cold and it can suck, and we can just be kind of miserable. And I don't think that there's anyone out there right now who hasn't been just cold and miserable. It doesn't mean that you have hypothermia, because you can be shivering and you can still control that shivering and kind of add more layers and take care of yourself. And it can still just not be fun, but you're not hypothermic. The places that we start to get more concerned is when we get someone who's moving towards that mild hypothermia and we have somebody who is shivering uncontrollably. So if you ever think about like you've got that and you're like you can't even stop as you're shaking. So we've got someone that's shaking uncontrollably because the body is really trying to use that shivering mechanism to be able to warm itself up. We start to get people who get clumsy and they get what we call the umbles because they get fumbly so all of a sudden their fingers don't work all of that well because the the body is not prioritizing putting blood out to the fingertips and so people all of a sudden have a hard time zipping their jackets doing their undoing their water bottles that type of thing people get um fum or i'm sorry stumbly so they trip over themselves again like their feet aren't working all that well um, they get grumbly. People tend to get like just really just grumbly and upset about the whole process. So we get mum and then people get mumbly and they start stumbling over their words. So if we've got someone who's un shivering uncontrollably and then they've got these umbles, we need to really start being concerned, particularly if that starts to go into some personality changes like confusion and agitation. There is a phase called moderate hypothermia, but it's less important that you know that and just know that as soon as we get someone who stops shivering or someone who has altered mental status or personality changes related to being cold, like we're in a place where we're, we need to get people like moving pretty quick. And so when we start looking at someone who has severe hypothermia, we've got someone who's not shivering, their muscles are super tight, 
Um, they're like, they're really kind of like corpse-like um, people. Their mental status will continue to decline, um, dropping down to the place where they're unconscious. And then if you do decide to ch um, check someone's pulse, you may not be able to find it because the heart starts beating so slow that it becomes really difficult to find that pulse. So we've got hypothermia and this is like where people, it's like where the body just can't make heat as fast as it is losing heat. Treatment, again, we want to make sure that we're preventing it as much as we can, but if we get to the point where we have someone with mild hypothermia, we want to remove the cold stress. And if that is taking off sweaty clothes, um, getting people out of a wet environment and doing the best you can to keep them dry, because again, remembering um, the evaporation piece, like people are going to start losing heat from their body that way. And then insulating people from heat loss. And so if that is sitting them on something that elevates them up from the ground, thinking a sit pad, a backpack, um, something like that. Um, and again, getting warm, dry layers on them. And then anything that we can do to promote heat gain. I'm looking back at that metabolism um, and looking at movement. And so if someone is able to swallow, they can maintain their own airway and it's not going to become a choking hazard, let's go ahead and give them some calories. Um, when I was in Minnesota, I loved... Um, um, just liquid jello and so we would take I would take green jello powder make it put a bunch of hot water in it like and that would be my quick sugars um, we can also take a look at hot chocolate something like that but we want something that has a lot of sugar plain tea black coffee those aren't gonna work because there isn't the sugar in it we want those that sugar is more important than than the liquid specifically so high sugar foods for those folks we do have someone with severe hypothermia, similarly we want to make sure that we've removed the cold stress and get them out of cold, wet clothing. And then we're going to build something called a hypo wrap, which you'll actually see in that photo where we're taking something like a tarp, we're putting a sleeping pad or some sort of insulation layer on top, getting that person into a sleeping bag or extra layers of clothes. Um, zipping them all up in that and then folding them in like a burrito. And if you're interested in seeing that process on our website, we actually do have the process of making a hypo wrap or a hypo burrito. But what that's doing is protecting the individual from further heat loss so that um, they're, not, they're not losing additional heat to the cold. Um, we can, in that hypo wrap, add heat packs. We can add hot water bottles, um, aiming for the core of, of the person. If we do have a person that doesn't have a pulse, we will go ahead and provide CPR for that person. Um, it's a little crass, but they'll say that you're not dead until you're warm and dead. And so, again, that heart just may be moving so slow that we want to be able to provide CPR if we're not finding that pulse. And Katie, if you want to hit the next one. So then we've got frost nip and frost bite, and I should have given you a quick warning that there are some graphic photos up there, but when we're dealing with frost nip and frost bite, we're dealing with actual damage to tissue. So where hypothermia is like the whole body losing heat, we're looking at specific damage to primarily fingers, toes, and the nose. Um, frost nip is the first thing that we typically see, and it really is telling us that the conditions are ripe for frost bite. So we start to see frost on the skin surface, fingers start to get numb, and they start to get kind of white. And so when we start thinking about frost nip, our, our great treatments, again, are the hands at the back of the neck, in the armpit, feet on someone's stomach, that type of thing, to try to get them to thaw. Thawing happens and there's no, there's no lasting damage. When we do move into frostbite, we're in a place where the cells of the tissue are actually freezing. And so we get numbness or tingling, we get cold white skin, um, and then depending on how the progression has gone, if we're at superficial, partial thickness or full thickness, we'll see um, kind of a varying, a varying level of like what the skin feels like from kind of soft all the way up to hard. Um, and then there is the possibility of thawing, but knowing if you look at the bottom right corner photo, like you start looking at seeing blisters on people's extremities. So working pretty hard to be able to avoid that. Um, if you'll hit the next one, Katie. Um, I don't have specific case studies, but I really want to challenge you all to think about it's just. Right? I think a lot of times we go out and we're like, we're just going to go out for one run. I'm just going to go 
um, cross-country ski around Pine Street Woods. I'm just going to go take a short snowshoe hike. Um, and when we say that, a lot of times we're saying that we, we don't perceive something as dangerous and we should be able to think all the time that like anything could go wrong. And so just thinking about a, a like a, a basic situation, if you think about heading out on a snowshoe hike or a cross-country ski and you're out with a friend and you're going along and you're about five miles out and then all of a sudden your friend's ski or snowshoe breaks um, and you're off path, you're not, you're not on the tracked areas anymore. Um, and your friend's like, all right, I've got this. I'm going to, I'm going to walk back and it'll be okay. And you're still on your mode of transportation. You're like, all right, I'll support this person. All right. But then the post holding starts and I'm sure you've all post hold. And if not, um, good for you. And you probably should go get some character building and give it a shot. But post holding when you're like up to your thigh in snow, it's like, it becomes really hard to walk. And so your friend gets really hot, really sweaty, all right? And so then all of a sudden they're like, all right, we want to stop and this isn't going to work. We want to fix this snowshoe. We want to fix this cross country ski. But now you have somebody who's super hot, super sweaty and start thinking about now what is going to happen because maybe it's going to take 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes to be able to fix this ski and this person is going to start losing, again, that body heat getting really cold and so thinking about what you carry in your pack to be able to do that and so just thinking I've got like a really small day pack here but I'm not carrying a lot of things but I've got a mug that has some hot chocolate in it I've got a really small it's like a quart size Ziploc bag that has an emergency bivy in it so it can be an extra layer for somebody I've got my, my puffy coat that I'm not wearing while I'm traveling, but I have it so I can take it out at breaks. And then I've got snacks. So I've got cookies and I've got gummy bears because those are, are pretty fast burning calories that I have access to. And so with only carrying a couple of additional items in my pack, I'm able to take really good care of my buddy, knowing that I want them to A, be safe and to be able to get out of the woods safely, but knowing that if they're in danger, that's going to put me in danger as well. Um, last, consider training. We've talked avalanche training. We've talked all sorts of different types of training tonight, but think about medical training too. Um, and just knowing that all sorts of things could go wrong. People have heart attacks, people, um, break bones. There's all sorts of things. So doing a little bit of work to figure out like how you can manage an injury or an illness in a back country is going to really set you up to, to be able to take care of yourself and others. And don't forget, prevent, prevent, prevent. Um, and that's all I've got. Thanks, Katie. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, if there's any questions, I'll wait for some to come in. If you asked a question before, it's probably been answered. Look in the questions and answers. There's lots of answers there. Um, do we have any other questions here? I don't think we have any open questions left. I'm going to leave them open, though, if anybody wants to ask questions. Um, at least I'll be sticking around for a little bit. Um, I do want to make sure we thank all of our partners for coming. And thank you guys all for coming. Um, it, we really want to share this. Like we said before, this is recorded. You can share it out later. We'll be sending that link out in an email. Uh, make sure you check up on our website for more upcoming events. Oh, it looks like we have one question for Katie. Um, is there one single medical know-how or tool you would recommend? Yeah, this is going to sound crazy, but I really recommend training um, because it's like knowing that you know what to do when something happens and having the confidence to respond is super huge. Um, beyond that, I think a, um, an emergency blanket's really good. A snack is really good. A first aid kit is really good. Um, and so there's no like one specific get out of jail free card, but um, I, I really do just push the training just so you, when you see something happen, you're like, okay, I've got this. And it, it's not super overwhelming and you, and you have some idea of what to do. Thanks and on that note, if you've had like a city first aid course, they're different than a wilderness first aid course. Uh, just so you know, they are different. They do have different things in them. So just so you're aware of that. If you've done a city first aid course, it's drastically different than a wilderness first aid course. 
so you guys are all aware about that. Yeah. Um, electrolytes are important, but I think it's also knowing that it's like that putting food in is just as important. So a lot of times with electrolytes, it's also the salts. And so snacking will take care of some of those salts. Um, and so if you're doing huge amounts of activity, lots of sweat, making sure that you are snacking. Um, and if you are interested in electrolytes, it's, it's certainly an option. Um, but plain water with a, with balanced snacking should, should meet all of your needs most of the time. All right. Well, it looks like I think that's all of our questions. Um, I think we're going to stop the recording. If there are any other questions that come in that like have great information in them, we'll be sure we include those um, in our follow-up email. As Angela mentioned, we'll be sending out a follow-up email with some um, more information about some upcoming events we've got, like Navigation 101, which is on January 20th. On January 14th, we have a Backcountry Basics thing that we're doing. Um, there are a lot of different virtual events that she gems is doing. So I highly recommend you guys check those out and see what's on there because this is really just a sneak peek of all the knowledge that you can gain um, to prepare yourself for this winter. So thank you all for coming and thank you to our panelists for sharing with us and sharing your experiences with us. Um, and I hope you guys all have a great night.